This week, the Knesset passed the first contentious judicial overhaul bill into law. So six months after getting perspective from philosopher Dr. Micha Goodman in the inaugural What Matters Now episode, I went back for more. Two constitutional instincts have been unleashed and clashing with each other. The Israelis want to be empowered through government versus Israelis want to be protected from government. I think that's what's happening in the streets of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and all over Israel as we're talking. Goodman is the author of the best-selling Catch 67 and The Wondering Jew. His book, The Last Words of Moses, just came out in English. For much of the past six months, Goodman has been performing a unique kind of reserve duty, speaking with people from all sides of the judicial overhaul conflict, from teams of politicians during the negotiations at the president's residence, to squadrons of pilots who are on the brink of refusing service. In keeping with this Tisha B'Av week, this is an in-depth and quite sober conversation. But as you will hear, Goodman is, as always, a dedicated optimist. I think the cynics will determine what will happen tomorrow and next week. But I think it's the optimist will determine what will happen next year and two years from now. So this week, I, Amanda Borchel Dan, ask philosopher Dr. Micha Goodman what matters now. Micha, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be here, Amanda. In this very contentious week, in the week in which we see the Knesset passing the first judicial overhaul law, and we're seeing tens of thousands of soldiers who are refusing duty, or at least stating they're refusing duty, I ask you, Micha, what matters now? Avoiding the deterioration of Israel into civil war and chaos. Okay, civil war is often or mostly related to, of course, taking up of arms. And I know that you have been speaking to soldiers who are on the brink of possibly refusing service. Can you tell us a little bit about this process? What have you been up to here? So my position from the very beginning was the following position. I'm against the judicial reform if it's done without massive majority and a great consent. At the same time, I'm against using the weapon, using the army as a vehicle to create political gains. And I think, by the way, this is the position held by most Israelis. Majority of Israelis are against this reform. I mean, as long as it's done without a massive majority. And majority of the Israelis think we should keep the army out of this debate. Now, that position of majority of Israelis is not materializing and not becoming a reality. Because against the will of most Israelis, the, ref- the first step of the reform has passed. And against the will of majority of Israelis, uh, pilots and soldiers and reserves have declared that if this passes, they're not showing up. So right now, the majority of Israelis have the minority of the power regarding these issues. You've been going out actively and speaking with uh, pilots and other soldiers. And first of all, what are you hearing from them? A lot of pain. A lot of anxiety, tremendous amount of anxiety, real fear that what happened this week is step one and step one and a slippery slope that on the other side, Israel doesn't have a autonomous, independent judicial system and Israel won't be a liberal democracy anymore. And that's not the Israel they, they, they're they willing to fight for. And that's the anxiety. That's the level of anxiety, of rage that, I, that I'm bumping into. Uh, speaking to these pilots, speaking to these soldiers, speaking to these, I must say, Israeli heroes. And I think they're making a big, big mistake, and I still have a lot of respect for them. You think they're making a big mistake by weaponizing their position in the army? Yes. I think one of the greatest achievements of this protest movement is it managed to be against the government and for the country. Very patriotic very passionately against this extreme narrow government and at the same time passionately expressing love for our country. This act where they're saying, well, we're not showing up to our duty, we're not showing up to the Air Force, we're not showing up to reserves. This act could be interpreted by many Israelis as an act where now they're not only against the government, they're against Israel. That's not their narrative. That's not their intentions. They have good intentions. They're experiencing it as, as an act of patriotism and they're fighting for the country. But... Uh, one of the greatest achievements of this protest movement is that it got roughly 50% of the Likud voters to sympathize with the protest. And I'm afraid that that massive achievement of this protest will be swallowed by this uh, very radical move. 
So, of course, one of the major forces in the anti-judicial overhaul protests are brothers in arms, the reservists who are refusing duty. And it's fascinating what you're saying about the patriotism of the the protesters. And, of course, they've adopted the flag and every protest includes Hatikva, the national anthem. But this uh, use of the reservists is is precedent building, wouldn't you say? Yes. What I tell the free service and the pilots, and these are amazing people, by the way, and I salute them and I admire them and I think, but I think they're making a, a, a mistake with unintended consequences. And one of the unintended consequences is the following. This was never done before. I mean, we've seen strikes in Israel, teacher strike, union strike, pilots in the uh, civilian pilots strike, allow strikes. But the military never went on strike. That never happened. This is unprecedented. And it's very obvious why it never happened. I mean, look around, look at Hezbollah, look at Hamas, look at Iran. This is not something that Israelis do. We've never done this before. But once it's done, there is a precedent. And it's a precedent It will be very attractive to replicate this precedent in the future because this action, this very extreme action is being normalized in Israel. The press have sympathy, the mainstream media is sympathizing this step. Three former chief of staffs, Amat Kalim, are embracing this step. So this very extreme step is experienced as something very not extreme, very normal, and legitimized, and it's also very effective. And that combination, Amanda, of a step that's legitimate, experienced as legitimate, and effective, I think will change Israel for years to come. I'll just give you an example. Let's say two, three years from now, God willing, we'll have a national unity government with Likud, with Gans, with Lapid, with Lieberman, a national unity government. That's what we need. And this government will decide that we need to do real steps to shrink the conflict with the Palestinians. And that means creating, without peace, on the ground, territorial contiguity for Palestinians. And for that, we have to uproot 20 illegal outposts of settlers in the West Bank. Maybe 35 illegal outposts. What are the chances that right-wing religious soldiers will say we refuse to do that? We're going on strike ourselves. What are the chances that they'll do that? Well, I think the better question is, what are the chances that they won't do that? Because now there's a precedent. And it's legitimate. And it's effective. And that would mean that the Israeli that we will not be able to create territorial contiguity for Palestinians, which means we won't be able to shrink the amount of the of control, the, the the amount of occupation that Palestinians are suffering from. And wouldn't it be weird, Amanda, that five years now people were asking why is nothing changing in Yudav Shimon or the West Bank or choose your terminology? Why is nothing changing there? And the reason will be oh, because of the pilots' strike in 2023. That is the law of unintended consequences. And the weird thing is, and here's the thing: once the army has the power to veto decisions of the government, and it's not the army officially; it's just large groups within the army. So once it has that power. So I would think it's fair to say that Israeli government can not execute controversial decisions because every side will veto it using their reserves and the military, their people in the military. And because almost by definition, big decisions are almost always controversial by definition, I think this probably means that Israeli governments cannot make big decisions anymore. Israel is becoming a country that can't do great things anymore. That is the law of unintended consequences. This is what I was trying to explain to these to these Israeli patriots. And because while they're trying to stop a regime change, they are unintendedly creating a regime change. It's like Israel now will have four branches of government, not three. Government, Knesset, Supreme Court, and the military. And every decision has to pass the government, be legislated in the Knesset, not be struck down by, by the Supreme Court, and now, from now on, also not be struck down by different groups within the military. So I was telling these pilots, listen, you're trying to stop a regime change and unintendedly creating a regime change. Maybe, for now at least, this is not a good idea. By the way, all my attempts to try to explain, to try to do this, I failed. We all failed. This happens. And now we have to somehow soften the repercussions of what happened this week. Okay, Micha, let's talk about how we got here. Obviously, we are talking about the elites of the army, but there's a lot on the judicial reform side that view the anti-judicial reform side as the elitists, as those who are out of touch, out of step with the common man. How did this come about? Okay, so I think we have here a tremendous historical moment in Israel. And by the way, 
this might have great outcomes at the end. I'll try to explain this later on. This might have great outcomes in the end. And I think people are hoping for Israel to collapse now and our enemies are waiting for us to really to destroy each other instead of them and being weak enough for them to attack us. I think, by the way, Amanda, if I had money, I would invest in the Shekel these days and invest in the uh, stock market in Tel Aviv these days because Israel will bounce back. I'll try to explain why. But this is a long journey. And I think just like great texts have layers you know, great sacred texts, according to Jewish tradition, have layers. There is a pshat. That's the most transparent layer of the text. Then there are deeper layers like the drash. And then there's the deepest layers of the sod. So I think just like great texts have layers, also great events have layers. And I think it'll be interesting for us to try to peel these layers. I think these events have three layers. Okay. I think layer number one is the following. Israel is divided into two camps. Every camp has a different constitutional instinct. And I want to try to listen with sympathy to the right, okay? And then we listen to the left with sympathy and empathy. But I just want to notice it's not right versus left because on the anti-reform camp, it's not just left-wingers. It's left-wingers, centrists, right-wingers. It's a very diverse camp. But the pro-reform is only the right, okay? So every one of these camps has a different constitutional instinct. And the instinct of the right is the following. When political power moves, is relocates itself, and it moves from the political branch of government to branches of government that are not political in the sense that they're not elected. So this is a process that Israel has been going through ever since the beginning of the 1980s. This is not just something of Aaron Barak in the 90s. In the early 1980s, this is a process that starts. And I think we discussed this a little bit on the last time we met, I think half a year ago. <laughs> That's right, six months ago. Six months ago. And how power has been shifting from the political branch of government to a non-elected branch of government. So many Israelis, this is how they experienced that shift of power. They woke up and they realized, well, when a lot of power is located in unelected branches of government, like the Supreme Court, so they experienced that as a problem because when a non-elected branch of government has a lot of influence on my life, well, it's a problem because I don't have influence on that institution. And when I don't have, I can't influence the institution that can influence my life, I feel disempowered. On the other hand, politicians, when they have a lot of power and they influence my life, I feel empowered because I can influence politicians because we're a democracy. We get to fire them. We get to hire them. The moment of firing and hiring our bosses, our politicians, is the day of elections. So when politicians have power in their hands, so in a situation that the institution that influences my life is an institution that I can influence their political life. And as a result, I feel like I have some control of my life. So as a result, power shifting from the political branch of government to the non-elected branch of government is experienced as a sense of disempowerment. Power now is located where I have no influence over it. What is this reform about? We want power back from the judicial system to the political branch of government. We want power to be where we can influence it. In other words, we want to be in control of our lives. We want to be empowered through the power of government. Which explains the Judicial Selection Committee emphasis, which explains basically every we, single slice of the salami. Every slice of this salami is about, is about Israelis wanting the power back. Okay, on the other side that's very much passionately against this judicial overhaul, there's a different constitutional instinct. And it's very unique to Israel. It's the following issue. Israel is suffering from a built-in democracy deficit. Israel is suffering from a deficit in checks and balances. For many reasons, I think you went into them last time, Israel was just created very, very quickly. And we didn't put much thought into this. And we didn't create a very massive intense system of checks and balances. And as a result, we have no vertical checks and balances. Like there's no institution larger than Israel that could strike down decisions of the, of the government of Israel, like the European Union. And we have no autonomous inst- institutions that are smaller than the Israeli government, like um, Texas, right? That has autonomy and the White House cannot completely control what's going on in Texas because Texas has a governor and has its own legislator. Well, in Israel, we have no autonomous political bodies that are smaller than the government and no political bodies that are larger than the government. So there's no vertical checks and balances. Now, we talk about horizontal checks and balances, they also barely exist in Israel because 
I'm sure our listeners know that the Knesset, our parliament, does, is not a check, does not block the power of government. It's kind of like the extension of the government. Because every government, by definition, has an automatic majority of the Knesset because it wouldn't exist if it didn't have a majority in the Knesset. And the Knesset itself, there's nothing to balance it. There's no, like, a, we don't have, like, a House of Lords or a Senate. So the only body, the only branch of government that could block the power of our government is the Supreme Court. That's the only thing we have. And if this reform or judicial overhaul would have passed, nothing, there would be nothing there to protect Israelis from the power of the government deciding to use its power against its citizens, against minorities, against individuals. There is nothing there to stop us besides the goodwill of the people in government. That I think is so important to emphasize, because if you think about the founders of our nation, they all knew each other really, really deeply, fought alongside each other, maybe with each other too. But they trusted each other for the most part. And this seems to be the real deficit. Well, if you want to understand the collective panic attack in Israel, that's a double deficit, right? Deficit in checks and balances and then deficit in, in trust that creates a panic attack. Why? Because if, let's say, after this reform passes and the Supreme Court cannot protect me from the power of government, all that's left, they have to trust the people sitting in government. And I take a closer look and I see who's sitting there in government and who do I see? Itamar Ben Gvir. Bezalel Smotrich, and that combination, Amanda, where there's no institution to protect thee besides those people, and those people are those people. And ministers. <laughs> and ministers. So that's a panic attack. And the panic attack, so I would say, and they're out on the streets fighting. And by the way, I support them fighting against this judicial overhaul. And here's the thing, and this is very important, both sides... I want to sympathize for one minute with both sides because the people on the right, their constitutional instinct is that they want to be empowered through government. The people against the judicial overhaul, they want to be protected from the government, from the power in government. I think there we have it. I think that's the shot. That's the first layer. Two constitutional instincts have been unleashed and clashing with each other. The Israelis want to be empowered through government versus the Israelis want to be protected from government. I think that's what's happening in the streets of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and all over Israel as we're talking. That's the pshat. That's the constitutional clash that's happening in Israel. But I think there's a deeper layer here. <laughs> there's a deeper layer here because I've been having conversations with Israelis on both sides in the past half a year. And you have also Amanda. And if we start with Israelis on the right, so this is how a conversation will sound like. The first few minutes, they'll be speaking about um, activism shiputi, about the Supreme Court overstepping and being too activist and striking down decisions of government and Knesset and taking power away from the people, all that constitutional lingo. But it'll take about three, four minutes when that rhetoric is over and they move into the, the real pain. And they'll mention the disengagement from Gaza. A man that's the disengagement from Gaza in 2005, Tish Abeav 2005, is back. And then someone mentioned Oslo. And then many will mention the Ma'abarot of the 1950s, when North African Jews came to Israel, when Mizrahi Jews came to Israel, and their experience and their narrative, and it's not disconnected from reality. They were treated as second-class citizens thrown into refugee camps living in tents in Ma'abarot, and they felt, and suddenly that's back. And from some people, you hear the Altalena, the Altalena. When Begin bought guns from France to Israel in the middle of, the, of, of a war independence, and it's a very, very complicated story, but the end of the story is that David Ben-Gurion gave an order to stop that boat at all costs, including shooting at the boat, and the boat was shot down, and 16 people from Begin's camp died. Suddenly, the Altalena is back. So you scratch your head and ask yourself, why is you bringing the Altalena back to life? And the Ma'abarot of the 50s? Why are all our bruises opening up now? And it hit me. That's what's happening now. Built up frustration. Frustrations that's being built up for 75 years are unleashed now as we're talking. 
And the disengagement thing is a big deal. For example, there is a narrative that while right-wingers were fighting the disengagement in 2005, so 14-year-old teenage girls were trying to, were protesting, I think they were, they were trying to uh, block roads. <laughs> Sounds familiar. It does. And they were thrown in jail for weeks. And as a friend of mine, an Israeli journalist, Amit Segal, said, when 14-year-old girls were in jail, we called up Bagatz, the high court. We called Bagatz on our phones. We called to Bagatz. And no one was in No one answered. No one was at home. This is a sense, a sense of a, the sentiment on the right that for 75 years we were mistreated. On the left, there's something else going on. And again, it's not left. It's left and center and right. Other people against the, the judicial overhaul. And there, it's a different narrative. It sounds like this. We're looking at the future of Israel. And if demography is destiny, so how does Israel look like demographically in 2040? Very ultra-Orthodox. Very right-wing, very messianic. By 2050, 2060, the liberal secular community will be a very, very weak minority. And then we look at this government and we're getting a, getting a glimpse into the dark future that we have. And it's a panic attack. This panic attack wasn't created by the judicial reform. It was triggered by the judicial reform. So here you have it, Amanda. This is, I think, the deeper layer the emotional layer, not the constitutional instincts clashing, but something deeper. From the right, we have frustration. From the left, we have anxiety. 2023 was the year where the frustration of the right is started clashing with the built-up anxiety of the left. But it's more than that and deeper than that because the frustration of the right, where does it come from? It's being built up ever since 1948. It's frustration that's been accumulating a long 75 years. It's a frustration from our past. The anxiety of the other camp is not anxiety directed at our, that's a result of our past. It's directed at our future. That's, as Israelis say, the event. That's what's happening. It's when anxiety clashes with frustration it is where future clashes with past. That's, I think, those are the real, raw, materi emotional materials that are being unleashed as we're talking in the streets of Israel. But I think there's also a deeper layer. <laughs> if we'll dig deeper. Let's okay. do it. <laughs> Let's do it. And then there's a deeper layer. The deeper layer, I don't know if it's deeper, but it's another layer, is we look at the polls, and we look at the serious polls, like done by a very impressive new think tank in Israel called Tachlit. And when you look at the polls, you see something very surprising. You see, Amanda, that most Israelis agree with each other. How shocking is that? That while we hate each other more than we've ever hated each other before just because of politics, at this high moment of hate, there's still critical mass of agreement. So this is the paradox of this moment, that Israelis hate each other, emotionally speaking, and agree with each other, policy speaking. Uh, and this is how the, the polls look like. The polls, while I just gave you a binary picture of Israel, right? People that are for the reform, people that are against the revolution. Right? People that feel built up frustration from the past, people that have anxiety from the future. And by the way, we could add more stereotypes to this binary description of Israel. We could say people that are for the reform, they are also for Bibi. People that are against also hate Bibi. People that are for the reform, also conservative. People that are against are liberal. People that are for are Jerusalem. People that are against are Tel Aviv. People that are for are Dati, are Dati religious. People that are against are Chiloni. And all our stereotypes of Israel, we could spill into this very neat binary uh, organization of Israel. Am I speaking English? I think so. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Our listeners should know that I'm an Israeli and I think in Israel. So sometimes if I don't say, if a word I say doesn't sound like is like English, it's probably not. Hebrew is fine here. Hebrew is fine. Okay. So we have like this Israel that's such a neat binary, you know, one Israel versus second, Ashkenazi Israel versus Mizrahi Israel. All the stereotypes are spilled into this and then this attempt to organize Israel using this dichotomy. But we look at the polls and realize this is a false dichotomy. Because according to the polls, we're not divided into two parts. We're actually divided into three parts. This is how it looks like. Try to imagine there is a small group in the left. Their position is not one inch, not one change, no reform, no matter what. We're not changing the constitutional status quo of Israel. 
We are conservatives. This is the left. <laughs> we want to conserve the status quo. In the right, uh, and it's not a small group, but it's not a very big group. This is a group that says we want a radical reform and we want it now. And we think we have the, the legitimacy to do it with the majority we received in the last elections, with the accidental majority we had. So in the left, no reform. In the far right, it's not even the far right, like from center far right, radical reform now with the regular majority. But then in the center, you have a group of between 60 to 70% of Israelis. Depends what day. But let's say 60%, okay? 60% of Israelis. This is what they say. We want the reform. We need to fix the system. Not this reform. The reform we need has to have two components. If I'm reading the polls correctly. One, it has to be a balanced reform. What does balanced mean? We're not buying this binary stuff. We're not saying either I'm empowered through government or I'm protected from government. We want them both. We want our politicians to have power and decisions about public policy should be made by the public and the Supreme Court shouldn't strike them down. At the same time, we have to be protected and to guarantee that the government can't use that power against us, against minorities, against individuals, against us. And the thing is, that's achievable. Outside of the political heated debate, the academic types, this is something that is broadly known from right and from left, the constitutional geeks of Israel have managed in different, in different settings to reach the comprom a balanced compromise. It's their we all know what it is even. And we want it balanced and not radical. That's one. Two, more importantly, any change in the judicial system has to be done with a large majority. What is a large majority? Larger than the majority you receive, a government received in its elections. Okay, so this is the invisible Israeli consensus. There is a minority that wants a radical reform. There's a minority that wants no reform. And most Israelis want a balanced reform that passes with the large majority. That's us. That's 60 to 70% of Israelis. By the way, something very interesting. You know how the metaphors on right and left were created? In the French Revolution, in the National Assembly, people that sat to the right were for status quo and against change. People that sat to the left were for change. What is radical? Radical, radix in Latin is shorish. It's like um, root. Actually, maybe English carries that a bit, right? Root. So radical change is to change something from its root. So it's very interesting that in Israel, the left is for the status quo. <laughs> and the right is for radical change. So you ask yourself, what happens when right-wingers start to think like left-wingers? And left-wingers think like right-wingers. What happens? Well, what happens? That's Israel today. <laughs> that's welcome to Israel. But most Israelis, 60-something percent of Israelis, they want change, not radical change, a balanced change, and a change that will be passed by a real serious majority. That's the Israeli consensus. So if we try to map out these three layers of what, what's really happening in Israel, we see two constitutional instincts clashing. We see two sets of emotions clashing frustration with anxiety, past versus future. And then beneath that, we realize that most of us agree. <laughs> so we hate each other. At the same time, we agree with each other and we're not aware of this paradox. This is the paradox of this moment in Israel, which would mean, Amanda, that if Israel does spiral into civil war, it would be the weirdest civil war in the history of civil wars. It will be a civil war between civilians that agree with each other. How bizarre is that? Here's, by the way, this is how a friend of mine, Efrat, my colleague, Efrat Shapiro Rosenberg from Bet Avichai, from our, we have a podcast, Biflegeta Machshavot. This is how she puts it. Emotionally, we're divided into two. Intellectually, we're divided into three. Right? Our emotional divide, frustration versus anxiety, that's two Israeli, two Israeli camps. But intellectually, regarding our opinions about policies, we're divided into three. And in the middle, there's the largest part of Israel. So here's the big question. Where is the energy going to be coming from? From the illusion that we're divided into two or from the reality that we're divided into three? From these binary emotions or from our opinion, not our emotions, our opinions. And there, there's actually critical mass of agreement. 
And this is going to be the biggest question that's going to define the future of Israel. Are we going to be divided into two or into three? Are we going to be hating each other and fighting each other or tapping into the invisible Israeli broad consensus and start healing the divide and reorganizing the judicial system and healing other problems in Israel? Micha, don't you think that there is a one that you're not talking about here, perhaps as much as he deserves, and that is Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who arguably could stop the wheels that are in motion, who could he can. re-navigate? He can. he can. Sadly, Netanyahu, this week, I think, made a very, very poor decision. This, is, this was my analysis to Bibi's decision, to support this first step of the judicial overhaul and not to compromise. He was presented with the following dilemma. If the law passes, Israel as a country goes into three different risks. Economic risk, there is a risk that investors will leave Israel. There is a risk that the, the credit rating will go down. I don't know if that risk will materialize, and, but there is a risk there. A second risk is a security risk, right? That pilots won't show up, that our military will start collapsing. I don't know if that risk will materialize, but the risk is there. A third risk is a diplomatic risk. With President Biden, with the White House, with the world, like we might go into a diplomatic crisis, President Biden asked maybe not to do this. And he did it anyway. So by enabling this to pass, he was willing to accept a triple risk on his country. But So why do you let it pass? Because if he would have stopped the legislation or accepted a compromise of the opposition, his government would have been put to risk. I don't know if that risk would have materialized. And if it, I assume his government would have survived this, but he was afraid because Yariv Levine would have resigned. It's possible that Ben Gvir would have left the government and the government would have collapsed and he would lose his power. So here was Bibi in an amazing dilemma. There's going to be a risk. The question is, where is going to be the location of the risk, the placement of the risk? Are you going to place the risk on your country by passing the law? Or are you going to take away the risk from the country and locate it and place it on your government? So what are you willing to risk, Bibi? Your country or your government? And I don't think this is a real dilemma. I think that for true leaders, there's no dilemma here. There's absolutely no, I, no I'm, uh, there's a parody of me in Israel. I say that every dilemma, there's sides to here, there's sides to there. There's, I don't think there's no sides to here, sides to there. There's only one right decision. If you have to choose where to place the risk, you risk your government and not your country. Your, the life of your political career and not the life of Zionism, not the life of your country. And sadly, he made the wrong decision. Now, I hope now that our country is at risk economically, militarily, and diplomatically, I hope these risks won't materialize. So Netanyahu right now, sadly, I'm saying, I have a deep appreciation for Netanyahu, sadly, I'm saying, he made a bad decision. He chose to put his country at risk. And uh, I just I could just share with you something that I said in the Israeli radio that day. Yonah Netanyahu, the Israeli hero, he was willing to risk his life in service of our country. His brother was asked to risk his political life in service of our country. At this moment, Bibi turned his back on Yoni. At this moment in time. I still believe that Bibi could come back. Bibi, that's Yoni's brother, could come back and take political risks to save our country. Just like he did in 2003, by the way, when he took political risks to save our economy, when he was the Asar Otsar, the Minister of, of Finance. But that's not the Bibi we're seeing yet. I hope he'll appear. I believe he can appear, but we can't count on that. You and I both lost brothers who are very young, way too young, just like Nan Yao. If somebody had said that to you about your brother, obviously you would act. But I think we're seeing a Nan Yao who is divorced from the thinking, feeling Nan Yao that we've seen in the past. And instead, he's being surrounded by this extremist echo chamber. Yes. And so the question becomes, in the current reality that we live in, not in this hypothetical, wonderful world that I hope will materialize in the future, which you'll tell us about in a second, how do we move beyond the Netanyahu who has basically created this storm that we are now in the eye of? So I don't really know how you move forward tomorrow, but I do think I have some ideas about a year from now, how this works, okay? Everything now is too close, too painful to understand. I don't have enough distance to understand what's happening tomorrow. 
And I think the cynics will determine what will happen tomorrow and next week. But I think it's the optimists will determine what will happen next year and two years from now. So this government, I don't know how much more life it has in it, but I assume it has another year or two, but this government is going to end. And how does Israel look like, not the day after these events, but the day after this government, which is, has two characteristics. It's a very narrow government, and it's a very extreme government. And that combination turns out is a poisonous com combination. So when we think about the future and how the present shapes the future, I think we should be thinking about not one thing, but two things. There are the events of the present that shape the future, but it's also the memories of these events that shape the future. And Amanda, what has more influence on the future? What happened or the memories of what happened? Now, many times it's the memories of the present that shape the future more than the present itself. And how will this present be remembered? So I want to share with you Ethereum developing. This government, this very extreme right-wing government, for many years was a fantasy in Israel among circles of the right. This fantasy has a name in Hebrew. Memshelet Yamin al Malé. There's no way to translate this. A totally total right-wing government. Right. A pure right-wing government. Okay. And this fantasy was very helpful for the, for the right because it was a great answer to a question. When you would ask people, you're in government for 40 years. Why isn't Israel the paradise you promised us it's going to be? Why is there still lack of security? A, a, a traffic jams? Is, by the way, that's the number one problem in Israel today. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe, yes. Um, security issues, economic issues. Why isn't Israel the problem? So you know what the answer is? Well, we were never really in power, the right. We always had a centrist or a liberal there to neutralize our power, to block us, to stop us from doing what we know, what we think we should do. People like Tzipi Livni and Yair Lapid and Benny Gantz and Ehud Barak. There was always a liberal, a centrist, a leftist there that was a stain on our government and we didn't have a pure right-wing government. One day we'll get what we want. One day we'll have a massive majority. We won't have to join any centrist or coalition. We'll have Memshelet Yamin al Male, a pure right-wing government. And then you'll see what Israel will look like. That will, that's the woe to utopia. Well, Amanda, you know what's the best way to ruin a fantasy? To make it a reality. <laughs> to make it a reality, to implement it. The best way to destroy a fantasy is to implement it. And now we're living the fantasy, we're living the dream. And many people, what's important, including on the right, including religious Zionists, including Likud voters, not small amounts, large amounts, are looking around, and this does not look to them like a utopia. This looks to them like a dystopia. This fantasy is being destroyed as we're talking. The day after this government is over, Amanda, Memshelet Yamin al Malé, the idea of a pure, extreme, right wing government will not be a fantasy, it will be a bad memory. Meaning the status of this idea has transformed from a fantasy regarding the future to a very bad memory in the past that we don't want to replicate. That's a big deal, Amanda, that many people on the right will not want to replicate this experiment, the destruction of this fantasy. Now, we know how this looks like because Israelis went through something similar before. To war in the 90s, we had left-wing governments that's right to implement pure left-wing ideology. And here's what happens when you fall in, here's the problem with idealism in general. When you fall in love with an idea, you become blind to reality. You love the ideology, you're impressed by the ideology, and you really want it to become a reality, so you don't listen to reality itself. So when Barak goes to Camp David to implement the perfect left-wing ideology, two-state solution, end of conflict, peace, so when the intelligence say, listen, don't offer Arafat everything, it won't end good, and the intelligence, the sheen, when people are, when different experts are trying to represent reality, the government, the, the prime minister was listening to ideology trying to impose the ideology on reality, but then reality rebels against the ideology. The second Antifada breaks, 1,100 Israelis are murdered, and the left has never recovered before, has never recovered ever since. You know why? Because Israelis are carrying a trauma from the left.
Here's my prediction, Amanda, and we are recorded, so I'm stuck with this. Putting it in a bottle, bearing in my backyard. <laughs> okay. Here's my prediction, is that what we're experiencing now in Israel, what the second intifada did to the left, these events are going to do to the right, creating a trauma. But let me be more accurate, not to, but to the extreme right, to a coalition with the extreme right. Meaning, after this is all said and done and over, Israel, Israelis will be graduates of two traumas. One trauma in the 90s, a trauma from pure left-wing ideology, the attempt of, to implement pure left-wing ideology. And we're traumatized from that. But now we have another trauma added to that, that balances that, a trauma from a pure right-wing ideology. Don't you think there's a third trauma, the trauma of a collective government such as Sharon when he was able to carry out the disengagement? Actually, I think the other way around. I think what Israeli history shows us is that national unity governments are very successful governments. I think these, maybe, maybe I'll say something about this. If we look at the history of Israel, we see uh, that uh, our greatest moments were led by national unity governments. I'm sure most of our listeners don't know this. But the Six-Day War, one of Israel's greatest victories, um, was led by a national unity government. Levi Eshkol, the great prime minister we had, I'm sure most of our listeners don't know his name, because part of his greatness, they didn't take credit for the Six-Day War. Moshe Dayan, that joined the government, I think five days before the war, took all the credit for the victory. <laughs> and Levi Eshkol, that really built the, built the military that won the war, He's not remembered, and I think it's part of the reason why he was a great leader. He gave credit. He didn't steal credit. And his large soul enabled him to create a national unity government, meaning before the war began, he asked Menachem Bacon to join the government, and Rafi, a certain branch on the left, to join the government, to create a national unity government, and that's a government that won the war. Between 1984 and 1988, Israel was in deep trouble, more than 400% inflation a year, and Israel was deep in our version of Vietnam, in Lebanon, Shamir and Peres united in a, very pro- in, a, in a very tough national unity government and shrunk inflation. They brought it down from 400% to like normal numbers and took us out of Lebanon. Finally, the second Tifada broke out. A national unity, unity government is created, led by the two titans of Israel, Arik Sharon, big Arik Sharon, and Shimon Peres. And Sharon and Peres together uh, go and Miftah Chomat Magen, Operation um, Defensive Shield, and destroy the Second Intifada. This is a law of Israeli history that we don't, we didn't notice yet. Narrow governments tend to fail. National, broad national unity governments tend to succeed. This government has two sins to it. It's very narrow and it's very extreme. That's a very poisonous combination. But I think if we look at Israel's history, we'll be now be graduates of two traumas, and that's pushing us towards the center. That might be pushing us towards a national unity government. And if stable, large national unity governments will be created in the future, we will look backwards and we say these were created not because events that happened in the past, but because the way we remembered the past. When there was pure lefting ideology that led to the Second Intifada, Pure right-wing ideology is leading to an internal intifada. I mean that metaphorically. Yes, an internal chaos. And, uh, and I think these two traumas might channel the energy of Israeli history towards the center, towards centrist governments, moderate governments that tap in to that invisible consensus that enable us to move from the false dichotomy of pro bb anti bb Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, conservative, liberal, pro-reform, anti-reform, that false dichotomy to move from there to the invisible agreement where 60-70% of Israelis agree on almost all issues. Our ability to tap into the invisible consensus of Israel depends on us forming broad national unity governments. I think the trauma from this government will give energy to uh, Israeli history to move towards that direction. Micha, we've taken up too much of your time already, but uh, it is Tisha B'Av this week. And I wonder if you could give us a little insight into your new book, The Last Words of Moses, that just came out in English. So this is highly linked to Tisha B'Av and highly linked to these uh, chaotic moments we're experiencing in Israel. 
because um, in his last speech, Sefer Dvarim, the book of Deuteronomy, is the last speech of Moses right before the people of Israel enter the land of Israel. And it's actually a shift of the people of Israel. It's a political shift. In the desert, they were powerless. When they enter Eretz Knan, they become powerful. And his last speech about is about how do you manage the greatest challenge of all times? Staying, being powerful. And how can power not corrupt you? And Mo- Moshe says to them that if power will corrupt them, their sovereignty will collapse and they'll be exiled from the land. The interesting thing in this speech is that it's out of context. And the following, we need to imagine the speech being delivered to the people of Israel and they have anxiety. They're about to enter Israel, to conquer Israel, to build a kingdom, to build a monarchy. And Moshe does not discuss the challenges of war, of conquering Israel, of building Israel. He's discussing a different challenge. How after you built everything, how do you keep it going? And he says, if you won't be careful, the whole thing will collapse, you'll be exiled. How weird is it, Amanda? And how interesting is it that what troubles Moshe is not the challenge of entering Israel and fighting to build Israel, but the challenge of keeping it alive and not losing Israel. Because Moshe thinks that for Jews, it's easier to build the country. It's harder to keep it going. In our first attempt in sovereignty, we lost it. Our gut kingdom was split in our eighth decade. That's in the time of David and Solomon. Our second attempt of sovereignty in the time of the Choshmonaim, the kingdom was split and then destroyed in the eighth decade. Now we have a third attempt. Will we outsmart ourselves? This is, I think, the biggest question. Will we outsmart ourselves? Will we be able to listen to the last words of Moses, to the wis- to our ancient wisdom, the wisdom of our past, that will guide us how not to replicate the pathology of our own past? Micha, thank you so much. Thank you, Amanda. Six months ago, I launched the What Matters Now podcast series to dig into hot button issues that affect Israel and the Jewish world. Each week, I, Amanda Borsheldan, examine one topic with one thinker, and I've spoken with politicians, academics, archaeologists, and a whole lot of lawyers. But there's one sentence from one interview with Weizmann Institute professor Shikma Bressler that I've thought about more than any other. Bressler is a major leader in the anti-judicial overhaul protests, and she said this. So we are in some sort of a civil uh, war. It's not, you know, the way that you imagine it, like big armies clashing in some uh, battlefields. That was in March, months ahead of this week's societal rending vote. Special thanks to Charlie Summers for his help with the What Matters Now transcripts. What Matters Now is produced and edited by the Podwaves. Have a comment about this or other episodes of What Matters Now? Email us at podcast at timesofisrael.com. Look for more What Matters Now episodes and subscribe wherever you find your podcasts. Until next week, Shalom. Shalom.